Um, also, I want to let everyone know there will be a reception uh, immediately after this, uh, following in the DRC2 auditorium, where we'll have a chance to mingle with the speakers and talk to the company people a bit. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, Michael Dixon with Unimed. Uh, Unimed is the technology commercialization and development entity here at UNMC. So our goal is to see technologies uh, that are created in the lab developed into products that help improve healthcare. Um, we really recognize that the technology development is a long, expensive process, and so that's why we created the demo day to try to give you, uh, to give everyone a glimpse at some of the hard work and development that's going into creating the technologies of tomorrow. So it, it's a very tedious process, it's a very expensive process, and I think we've got some companies that are just doing an amazing job developing products. And these are really the, the products of the next generation. So we're, we're looking forward to seeing them develop these technologies further. Uh, I don't want to hold this up too long, so I'll get started with our first introduction. Um, so the, the first presentation of the day is Dr. Dan Anderson. and. Um, Dr. Anderson is a, a cardiologist here uh, at UNMC, and what he's going to talk about is the number one killer in the U.S., and, and I promise not to make this joke, but it's not Ebola. Uh, it's actually cardiovascular disease. So um, Dan's going to talk to us about a discovery that, that his team has made, and, and really uh, something they're looking at developing, oh, here's your clicker, and they're, they're looking at developing the next generation biomarkers to really help determine um, risk factors for cardiovascular disease. And I will, with that, pass this over to you. Presentation set up. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Dan. Truly a pleasure to be here and visit. Uh, I, I always tell everybody when I talk about our research, uh, you know, there's quite a passion behind it to the point where it, it, it honestly gives me goosebumps. Um, and so I hope to convey that excitement because I think in here there's some real opportunities that, that, that we're excited about from a medicine perspective. What, what I really wanted to spend the next minutes about is, is a long worded name which we'll refer to as MA from here on out. But it's malondialdehyde acetaldehyde. And what we've found is that this is a molecule that's associated with cardiovascular disease. Um, and what we think is really a predictor of cardiovascular disease in a, in a way, in a fashion which we have not been able to do before. If you look at this, and I think this is a sobering fact that most people come to realize, is that everybody has coronary artery disease. I had a friend ask me, well, why don't we do angiograms and things like that on patients? And I'm like, because everybody has it. The question is, is who's going to get in trouble with it? 70% of people who are in their 40s have coronary artery disease. Not all of this disease progresses to a cardiovascular event. So many people live their entire life and never have a heart attack, never have a bypass surgery, never have any issue with it, but they have disease. The question is why? Why one not? Why the other has disease? Our best practice is to treat people who are at risk. We treat people who have tobacco use history, who are diabetic, who are hypertensive, hyperlipidemic, and if you're old enough, you get it. So age is a predictor. But honestly, this best practice is inadequate. And I think that's really the thing that was exciting when we saw this, was it became an opportunity to be better at predicting disease and practicing medicine. I think this is a snapshot that I put in here at last minute. 1996, we actually made these comments. The overt signs and symptoms of coronary artery disease before treatment is no longer justified. It's honestly more and more a failure of medicine to have a heart attack at the age of 50 because you didn't know it was even there. The truth is, is we need to be better about it because the mortality of the heart attack is huge. So the question really comes up, what's needed? We need to be better about recognizing that 40% of people, that 70% of people who are 40 years old. Who has the disease? Who in here has disease that's going to progress? And we actually need to differentiate what we call disease. Who is it that has disease but lives to be 90 and never has any problems? I might actually challenge that we break it down. We, ch we, we break it down into stable disease, so a lesion that doesn't change over time, versus a lesion that's progressive, it gets worse, versus with treatment, it actually gets better, and you can reverse the effects. We have no way to predict that. And in fact, we often don't even know people have the disease until they've had their event. So this is the question, how can we better predict that? And then how can we predict the guy who's 50, has the heart attack, yesterday was healthy, today is dead? That's really the way I refer to it. And it's recognizing those patients before the event. That's the value. That's the value of this in the medicine. 
So what we've stumbled on as a group, and you can read a little bit about it in the promo, is that when we looked at the plaque, this is the plaque that causes the heart attack. This is the guy at 50 who's dead because he had a huge heart attack and died. If you look at these pro this tissue, what we find is there's modified proteins. And it's modified with this ma epitope. And to, just to give you a snapshot of what I mean by that, is that this is a protein in your cell. Very important in functions of cells and cell proteins. This protein can be modified by this ring structure, which we call melondialdehyde, acetaldehyde, or ma. What's important is that modification is very potent. It affects the protein. It affects the protein such that it is a very potent immune adjuvant. What does that mean? That means that where this protein function normally, all I have to do is put this ring structure on it and I can form antibodies, autoantibodies, I can start inflammation, I can cause dysfunction in the cells and the tissue just by that simple modification. And we understand now how that's happening. What's important in the very specific small area of data I'm going to present today is that this immune adjuvant revolts, results in antibody production in the plasma of somebody who has coronary artery disease. So when we start thinking about this, this is the artery you're born with. By the time you're 20, you have a little bit of narrowing. By the time you're 50 and 60, you may have a very significant blockage. Or this is the guy who had a little bit of narrowing yesterday. That ruptured, caused a clot, and is dead tomorrow. I mean, that's the reality of coronary artery disease, the silent killer, dead at 52. That's the typical patient. So the question is, is what's the difference? How can I have this my whole life, or this my whole life, and not progress to this, and not be dead at 52. So when we look at this MA antibody, we saw some differences. The short of it is, is we basically have developed an assay to look at the antibodies to that MA structure, the protein. Simply put, and not to go into a lot of detail, this is a basic ELISA assay. It measures the concentration of antibodies in the serum at any one point in time to that MA structure. And we measured antibodies in patients who had normal coronary artery disease, patients who had obstructive coronary artery disease, a little bit of coronary artery disease, and people who had the heart attack. And what we found that we've never been able to see in medicine before was that people who had coronary artery disease had increased elevations of antibodies. Now to go into a little detail, this is an IgM. So it's a, it's a class of antibodies. This is an IgG antibody. It's a different type of antibody. Where this is an IgA antibody, and it's yet, yet a different type of antibody. And what we found was that when people had coronary artery disease, they had elevation of IgM, IgG, and IgE. When we looked at people who had acute myocardial infarction, they had even a greater elevation in IgG. And I think what was really quite neat was multiple fold increase in people who had stable progressive coronary artery disease. So what we begin to see when we saw this was we were totally excited. We saw if you have an elevated antibody titer, it helps us differentiate if you have coronary artery disease. If you have M or G, are you the person who's at risk for a heart attack? Or the big differentiator is if you have a lot of A, are you the person who has coronary artery disease that's stable, progressive? You may need a stent. You may need bypass surgery. But you're not the guy who's dead at 52. So those differences were important because it allowed us to, one, capture the disease before we would have typically recognized it, and two, differentiate people who and how they would progress. So instead of looking at it like this, what we begin to think about it is this same disease process reflected in the mechanism. So you have a normal protein. When you ma modify it, you make antibodies, G, M, and maybe a little A. This is not a problem, but it causes progression. Versus the gentleman or somebody who has very obstructive coronary artery disease, it's been modified to a greater extent. And the antibody profile is different. 
there's now many more IgAs that reflect the physical changes that may have occurred in this protein versus the gentleman who's dead at 52 when you over modify or you very or you modify it in a way that causes changes now you see a structure change in the protein that reflects the different progression of the disease so at least we're seeing the antibody profile change but we think it's related to the nature of how the proteins themselves are being affected that relates to the disease so we have a marker of what we think is associated with the different disease phenotypes that's something we've never been able to do in medicine before so the summary and the snapshot is, is that you have increased anti-MA antibodies. And you have that with the coronary vascular disease, coronary artery disease. If you have a high IgM and an IgA, it's associated with somebody who might have an acute myocardial infarction, the dead at 52. If you have a high IgA, it might be somebody who has significant disease that progresses who may need bypass surgery, but not the guy who has the heart attack. So what we're really talking about is if we look at the ratio of these antibodies, we think that's the predictor of the disease process. And that's what we've seen in our patients and our people that we've studied. So the overriding hypothesis and our, and our, our thoughts that go into this is, is there's a very complex relationship between the anti antibodies, the isotype antibody titers, with the isotype antibodies with the various cardiovascular proteins, that really it's these modified proteins at any one point in time that are related to the specific disease entity and the disease process. We also think this changes over time. So early, the profile may be different when you're in your 20s and your 30s that evolves and progresses with or without disease as you get older that reflects the aging process of the coronaries and just generally aging altogether. We do believe that these antibody levels change over the course of the disease. Beyond the measure of progression, we think that MA titers essentially serve as a treatment to target biomarker. So in other words, when we effectively begin to manage that patient who has stable disease to the point where maybe we can regress the disease with, with aggressive blood pressure control, lipid control, we actually modify and we actually change the antibody titer profile. So we think it's going to be a target for that. We know that it's associated with other inflammatory diseases. We've seen this in peripheral vascular disease, which is essentially atherosclerotic disease in the peripheral arteries versus atherosclerotic disease in the coronary arteries. Not a surprise, but we see that. We also see an association with the aortic aneurysms. And we also, in addition, See, it's associated with other inflammatory disease. We've done some work with rheumatoid arthritis. There's inflammatory markers there. And there's nice, there's overlap between all of these disease entities. The short of it is, is our active research is we're really focused aggressively on characterizing the proteins that are modified. That's what we call it, adducted proteins. And we're really looking at with that information is developing even more specific testing that's maybe even organ specific, time specific, and disease specific. And I didn't even get the time warnings. So truly, open to ask a lot of questions. We have a, a lot of data, lots of implications. We could talk for hours. Uh, I have a scientific question and a business question. Uh, the scientific question is, can you test to see if there's any association Great questions. <laughs> um, actually, we've looked at some, we've started some studies looking at intravascular ultrasound, looking at the characteristics of the plaque morphology and association of the antibody titers during acute MI, during heart catheterization. Um, I think you're exactly right, looking at calcium scores, because if you think about the IgA class that's up in people who are calcified and have coronary bypass grafting and maybe are diabetic, um, we would, we, I would expect I think we would expect that there's an increased IgA titer that might be associated with calcification. Um, 
And so I do think that those relationships of acute necrosis versus you know, uh, necrotic core versus calcified core of atherosclerotic disease, there probably is a relationship. And I think one of the things that we've hypothesized is what mechanistically does that drive? What's the mechanisms for the progression of the disease that's associated with the antibody titer shifting that occurs over age? Um, so I do think it's a, it's a, great, it's a great question. Um, back to the, to the business question is have we looked at, you know, uh, the, or the question about LDL and other trials. Indeed, we have. We have a partnership with um, one of the, the investigators at Harvard Brigham Women's where we're actually looking to confirm and run all of these assays on those cohorts of patients and looking at recurrent events. Um, we have a couple other serum trials that we've looked at as well. And I think we've developed a strategy where we can try to evaluate the impact and the relative risk of these measures to cardiovascular events that is are predicted. Um, and to the LDL question, absolute central core to it. I think the, the neat part about the LDL is it's the harbinger of all oxidative stress as much as we understand it in atherosclerotic disease. We think this is a parallel process. Um, we think our mechanism may be even more powerful and better predictive than LDL because we have looked at antibody titers to uh, modified LDL and modified human albumin. Um, and we just published in PLOSE where the modified LDL did not predict, but the modified MA albumin did predict. So there's probably a mix of both. I'm not sure I can actually answer exactly the question, but in places where LDL has not been an answer, anti-MA titers have been an answer. Absolutely. Yep, and I think that can be the multiplexed assays that can be predictive of disease where you may not have had it before. Exactly right. Can you discuss the patient population that you've been doing? Absolutely. So if we go back to what Joe is asking here, is if we look at this group of patients, what we did was we took individuals who were relatively age matched, there's a little bit younger here, but really non-significant difference, who had no reported diseases. So this is a group of patients who are in their 50s and 60s right here, who had no diseases, not taking medications, and with that, that's their average titers. Quite comparably below. Versus people who are essentially at the cath table. Some symptom of cardiovascular perfusion, chest pain, acute myocardial infarction, or people who had documented coronary artery disease and on average underwent a three-vessel coronary bypass grafting. So effectively, the three groups of patients who are positive from MA had documented coronary artery disease versus the group who had no known disease, but you'd suspect they had some. So the titer's up a little bit on that, on that control group. One of the things we're interested in is looking at, if you're 15 and you're 20 years old, what's your titer? What's the phenotype? What's the progression as we age and we develop coronary disease? But the people who had known documented coronary artery disease had a significant elevation in these antibody titers. Absolutely.